Bad religion. Hmm. Bad wars. And a good God. I want to talk about those three things. Jesus was a man of peace, but his father is a God of war. We may not like this fact, but the Lord is a man of war. And I want to talk about war. My people in Israel are all too well acquainted with war. Hamas, Hezbollah, Syria, Lebanon, and Iran. It even feels like some anti-Semitic members of the United States Congress would prefer to see Israel obliterated. But where is God in all of these wars? Sadly, too many lives have been destroyed by bad religion and bad wars, which are often the result of bad politics. But my goal is to remind us that in spite of these realities, I want to point us to a good God. Welcome to Crosstalk. My name is Randy Weiss. I'm a Jewish believer in a Jewish Messiah, and I think we need to discuss war. Like it or not, this is not a topic to be ignored. Jesus warned that in the last days we'd have wars and rumors of wars. North Africa, North Korea, Eastern Europe, China, Taiwan, Russia, Ukraine, wars and rumors of wars abound. But this is not new. Neither is tyranny, dictatorships, or fascism. Talking about bad wars and bad politics, do you remember LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, or Richard Nixon, Tricky Dicky as his, he was called by those who hated him? These were American presidents who oversaw most of the Vietnam War. Even if you're not that old, You've likely seen the black and white POW MIA flags at a government building, a, a post office, or in the yard of a family of an old soldier. These two abbreviations have deep meaning. POW stands for prisoner of war. MIA is an abbreviation for those warriors who never came home, their remains were never recovered, or they are still reported as missing in action, MIA. For the record, the Vietnam War has been over for longer than most people have been alive. But there are still more than 1,500 American soldiers who remain listed as missing in action. And more than 58,000 Americans perished in that forgotten war that America famously lost. But we lost more than a war. Many understand that it was in South Vietnam that we lost our innocence. And then we badly mistreated many of the veterans who served in that war. I'm personally ashamed of that failure. All of our troops at home and abroad should be respected and honored. I must also admit that in doing the research for this program, I was shocked to learn that combining the death tolls from North and South Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, the Asian death toll exceeded three million souls during that conflict. Make no mistake, America is not the only culprit to be blamed for this, but that statistic should be burned into our consciousness. The rapid expansion of communism did bring death to the weak. Still, totalitarianism, communism, and socialism remain serious threats to our freedom. That is why it is so frustrating to many Americans who see our government as having been infiltrated by avowed socialists and some anti-American and anti-Israel pawns of our enemies. Such hateful politicians work to damage the policies that make our nation strong and keep our nation safe. America must sustain a voice for democracy in the world. It seems to be getting harder due to poor leadership and foolish policies. I'm not a political theorist or a military strategist, but I think some of the blame for this mess 
can be traced back to my generation and the seeds of discontent sown during the rebellious years of the Vietnam War era. A few things are sure about that time. America was revealed to be a nation with strong opinions and weak morals. And the draft was a miserable method to populate an army. It's rarely a good plan to force civilians into conscripted service to fight a war that the nation's leaders prohibited our soldiers from winning. At least that was how things Look to fellas my age at that time and a lot of people older and younger. Whereas today's army is populated by volunteers who serve by choice. I mean, today's military offers a proactive call to patriotic service with financial benefits and career opportunities. During the draft era, it was a different story. If your number came up in the lottery, it was suit up show up or get locked up. This was not America's finest hour. My friends and I fell into three basic groups relevant to Vietnam. Some of us went to war, some of us stayed home, and too many of us never came home. The most precise total of American losses is 58,219. Every American death was a tragedy, and no wounded warrior from any war should be forgotten. Yet surprisingly, most folks are unaware that nearly as many Americans were dying each and every year on our highways as had been killed during the entirety of the long, drawn-out war in Vietnam. We carried signs against the war and against the draft, but I can't recall ever carrying a protest sign for mandatory seat belts or lower speed limits. Let me tell you what I do recall. I remember sitting around campfires, getting stoned, becoming an addicted coke freak, and singing songs like, where have all the flowers gone? We talked passionately about Vietnam, government conspiracies, and how to get really good draft deferments. It was a confusing time. Bob Dylan said the answer was blowing in the wind, but America was in a tornado. And talking about bad weather, how many of you remember the weathermen? Well, those infamous folks were not meteorologists. They were a radical branch of the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society. Trust me, the SDS really didn't want a democratic society any more than the 1968 Chicago Democratic Convention represented American democracy. It didn't. The 1960s were filled with high-flying ideas and low-lying ideals. Bad religion was divisive. Bad war followed bad politics. Racism was evident and conflict was everywhere. The war in Vietnam created a war in middle America. It was us against them, young against old, the powerless against those in power. Many of us were old enough to die on a battlefield, but too young to vote for the leaders who would send us to our death. If you recall, we were being drafted at the age of 18, but back then we couldn't vote until we were 21. And few politicians, considered the demands of non-voting citizens. In 1776, our wars were declared by the men who would actually fight those wars so their sons and grandsons could live in peace and enjoy freedom from war. Sadly, by the time of Vietnam, it was well-to-do fathers in Washington who sent the sons of poor strangers to fight for the fuzzy goals of fuzzier politicians. The protests and demonstrations gave the youth a voice that could not be ignored. Those conditions led to what was often described as the generation gap. The ideals of youth collided with the experience of age. Young and old formed philosophical battle lines. The distance between the generations became a communication gap that few could bridge. Yet even bigger gaps existed that are usually not discussed. I believe those in power wanted to retain power regardless of the cost. 
while the powerless wanted to gain power at any cost. It was easy to identify the combatants in this ideological battle between the young and the old. I mean, some of us really wanted to see meaningful changes in our country, but most of us just didn't want to carry a gun in the jungle or be buried with a GI haircut. A lot of us were convinced that most politicians were evil and nobody over 30 could be trusted. I played in a rock and roll band back then. Our band played a song called My Generation, made famous by The Who, that declared, I hope I die before I get old. Well, one of their band members, Keith Moon, uh, kind of my idol as a drummer, well, he got his wish. It was an ugly time, and life in America got very ugly. The drug genie was out of the bottle and granted far too many of our wishes. Many of our rock and roll icons learned about the cost too late. We used bad drugs, promoted bad ideas, elevated bad people, and fought what many believed was a bad war. Things were so bad that some even believed that God had died. But wasn't that then and this is now? Well, certainly. But in light of recent wars and strains on our patriotism, I need to make some confessions and do a little history. How many of you remember the slogan, Make Love, Not War? That was our battle cry in the 1960s. Thousands of Americans protested against the war in Vietnam. Many of us were not only against that war, but we were against war in general. Now, even though many of us were godless heathens pretending to live under a variety of religious traditions, we were quick to bring God into the debate and place Him on our side of the argument. Everyone seemed to understand that God is love and war was evil. Well, God is love, and evil things happen in every war. In some ways, our anti-war movement took the philosophical high ground by parading for peace. But then we depreciated our cause by stereotyping our brave troops as baby killers and accused them of heinous crimes against powerless people. War can be very evil, and war atrocities did happen. Perhaps the 1968 My Lai Massacre was such an example. Many believed that American GIs ruthlessly killed innocent women and children. But that does not suggest that all U.S. troops were guilty of what a few may have done. No, absolutely not. Likewise, all protesters against the war were not drug-crazed communists. Some acted on their deeply held beliefs that war was wrong. One who was philosophically opposed to war in general was often called a conscientious objector. Usually this was based on legitimate religious convictions, the good kind of religion. The government made allowances for COs, as they were called. As an example, instead of a gun, a true conscientious objector was given the right to carry a Bible as a chaplain or bandages as a medic. They fulfilled their duty to the nation in ways that did not force them to violate their religious beliefs. Yet many objectors to the Vietnam War were much more specific. They disagreed with the war in Southeast Asia. It was that war not war in general, to which many objected. But our protests created what was deemed to be anti-American behavior. Of course, that raised a few obvious questions. Do citizens of a nation have the right to pick their wars? Was Vietnam a just war? Is there such a thing as a just war? How are citizens supposed to know the difference? The Iraq conflict was a perfect example. If you asked enough folks, you'd hear enough opinions about weapons of mass destruction, WMD, you'd realize that some of us will never agree. Nevertheless, at some level, we need to unify, support our troops, pray for peace, and fight for freedom. I think it is time for ugly Americans to 
stop being ugly. I guess there truly are just wars and unjust wars. I can't tell you exactly how to sort them out, but I can ask you to respond to your conscience when you hear about oppressed peoples. I'm not sure how to evaluate the tragic consequences of violent military confrontations, but I can tell you that it is always right to pray for our leaders. It is always right to pray for our troops. It is always right to show concern for the oppressed and to comfort the less fortunate. It is even a Christian requirement to love our enemies. Nevertheless, sometimes evil people need to be challenged on the battlefield. And sometimes weak people need to be defended by stronger people. Frankly, I'm glad that I'm not required to analyze and make those decisions. And I sure wouldn't want some of my Facebook friends to make those calls or hold the launch codes. Some decisions are justifiably left up to our nation's leaders. Remember, bad wars often come from bad politics or bad religion. That is why we must pray for wise leaders and God's guidance. It is also why it is imperative for Christians and Jews to pray before selecting our leaders on the ballots when we vote. However you vote, and whatever your view of war, like it or not, history proves that some wars are necessary. I mean, we're all glad that Adolf Hitler was defeated, and Joseph Stalin is not in charge of our rations, our economy, or our national moral character. But what of wars? The Bible seems to confirm that God launched many of the wars detailed in Scripture. Does that concept rub you wrong? Does God start wars? Before this series is over, I will prove to you that it is true, and He does. I will declare and unequivocally show that the Lord is a man of war. But first, I want to return to that earlier era of American history that I discussed in our opening segment. I do have a few critical thoughts about Vietnam. I think it was America's perfect storm. Vietnam came at the, the confluence of the civil rights movement, the sexual revolution, and the beginning of our shift from a Christian worldview to the post-Christian era in which we now live. It clearly divided our nation and announced America's moral decline. Vietnam defined the two sides of America. It was the classic us against them debacle without middle ground for debate. According to us, our side wanted peace. Their side wanted war. According to them, they were patriots defending freedom. We were traitorous criminals unwilling to do our duty and unfit to share in America's freedom. Everything was reduced to slogans. Our side wanted to make love, not war. Their side declared America, love it or leave it. I had a cousin who was forced to do just that. He was a true conscientious objector, a CO. He gave up his friends and family for his convictions. My cousin fled from America to avoid the draft because he was unwilling to support the war effort in any way. He paid a heavy price, and he chose Canada over Vietnam. Was he right or was he wrong? When my number came up in the draft lottery, I was ready to head for Canada. But my reasons were not as noble as his. I just didn't want to go to Vietnam. You would find my cousin to be a very interesting fellow. Uh, he got deeply involved in Eastern religions and also spent time in India at the feet of his guru. This was all happening while I was separated from the rest of my family due to having become a Christian. That was kind of a scandal for a Jewish family. In fact, back in early 1973, my cousin was sending me books from Canada trying to convince me to check out Buddhism, and I was sending him books trying to convince him to check out Jesus. Later in life, he returned to being an observant religious Jew. And thanks to the pardons granted by President Gerald Ford, my cousin returned to the USA 
and he became a tenured university professor. But I promise you that we still have some very animated discussions about religion and politics when we get together. Nonetheless, anyone with a TV living in the 1960s and early 1970s were deeply impacted by the nightly TV reports from the battlefields of Vietnam. We saw horrendous napalm bombing episodes on the news. We watched a scorched earth policy destroy Vietnamese farming families. Humble thatch shacks and rice paddies were being annihilated by U.S. troops on primetime TV. But that was many decades ago. It was a different world and a different America. We had a short memory and a cloudy crystal ball. We could never have imagined the changes that would come to the modern world through bad religion, bad wars, or bad politics. Can a Christian TV preacher explore these issues? Well, I intend to because I must declare a good God in this fallen world. You see, a people's appetite for war will frame their politics. But God's appetite for war often frames his people. This is especially true when God's people are confronted by evil, be it their own or that flaunted by the enemies of the weak and oppressed. And that will be the topic of our next episode in this series. In case you can't rejoin us next time, check out our YouTube channel or visit our website at crosstalk.org. The name of the series is Bad Religion, Bad Wars, and a Good God. I, I do hope to hear from you, so write to me today. My name is Randy Weiss. This is Crosstalk. Our address is P.O. Box 2528, Cedar Hill, Texas, 75106, USA. <laughs> Proud to be an American, my God. And in these troubled times, with wars on the horizon, I want you to know that our Lord still promises peace. War is part of the fate of mankind living in our fallen world. Peace is the promise of God to all who humble themselves, acknowledge their sins, and receive the Prince of Peace as their Messiah. Until next time, Shalom.